morning. Go ahead. Don't, don't sit down. Greet 10,000 people. Tell them God loves you. Go ahead. God loves you. This is the best time to meet new people here. Good morning. I guess some cannot make it. It's too cold to wake up. That's okay. I hope you can make it in the afternoon. We have two more services for you, 3 o'clock and 5.30. We just want to thank God for the last two days. <clears throat> we had this disciple-making convergence. And 250 people came, 70 came from this church. And people from Mindanao, again, Cebu, Tacloban, Iloilo came. The standing orders of Jesus in the last days will be to make disciples. It's, it's always been there. That's why it's called the standing order. It's not something that we only do on good times or in bad times, but when we say it's a standing order, we have to do it all the time. And today, we are going to look at the standing orders of the gospel from just one verse, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 to 18. I'm sorry I don't have the outline in your guide, but I have a very simple message today. One verse and three points. Let's all read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. A hundred years ago, a man, a man by the name of Professor James Denny of Scotland when he read this, he said, this is not only a command. It's a standing order of the gospel. And again, it's a standing order because it applies to every one of us in every situation. It does not apply to a selected few. It does not apply to circumstances when things are good that you do this. No, it applies to every situation in our lives. In fact, in Greek, this is very, very clear. These imperatives are in the present tense. That is why when it is in the present tense, this is how it should be. It says, continually rejoice, continually pray, and continually give thanks. I think I have a slide for that. Again, everybody please read. Continually rejoice, continually pray, and continually give thanks. This is a big challenge and a great challenge for all of us. You know why? We would have no problem if the text said rejoice sometimes, pray occasionally, give thanks when you feel like it, no. It says here, continually rejoice, continually pray, and continually give thanks. That's where the problem comes in, the modifiers. It's the always, it's the continually, and in all circumstances. Now, when you look into that, it gives us some suggestions here. These are the standing orders, no problem about that. But you see, the real impact of the gospel will be seen the most when we don't feel joyful, but you are. The greater impact of the gospel can be seen the most when we don't want to pray, but you still pray. The greatest impact of the gospel is this, when we don't see any reason at all to give thanks. But we continue to give thanks no matter what. And not only that, 
when you find yourself doing that, this continually rejoicing and praying and giving thanks, when you find yourself doing that in spite of what is happening to you, then you begin to discover that your Christianity is genuine. And it's not something a counterfeit. It's genuine. Why? Because that's how the Lord works. You see, when you say that you have Jesus in your life and you have accepted Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and Jesus is in you, then you have that power, you have that desire to continually rejoice, to continually, say it, pray, and continually what? Give thanks. Then you know and you know that the God who loves you, that the God who died for you, that the God who paid the penalty for your sin is really in you. And that's how it works. He works inside out. So sometimes we find ourselves not doing that. We sometimes find yourself, you know, you, you, because we, we have not been taught that these are standing orders. Through the years, we have been taught that you only do these things when things are good. But these simple commands only reveal the true life-changing power of Jesus Christ in our lives. Especially when that power is in you and all of a sudden you have this desire not just to pray, but what kind of a prayer? Continually. Continuous prayer. And we are going to talk about that. And you find yourself always rejoicing, always giving thanks. So I'm going to look with you here the three standing orders of the gospel. It's very simple, but I hope it speaks to you today. Always rejoicing. Number one. Why? Let's look at a different translation here. The message, it says, Be cheerful no matter what. Be cheerful no matter what. Always rejoicing. Be full of joy. When? All the time. How can that be? Be happy in your faith. All the time. So let me... Say it again. The real impact of the gospel will be seen when we don't feel like being joyful, but you are joyful. The greater impact of the gospel will be seen when we don't want to pray, but we still pray. And the real impact of the gospel is this, when we don't think of any reason at all to be thankful, but you are thankful. We just finished December, and we said that when the angel appeared to the shepherds, and they talk about the birth of Jesus, he said, I bring you what kind of news? What kind of news? Good news of great joy. Have you thought about that? I bring you good news of great joy, that will be for all the people. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. In other words, whenever the gospel is shared, whenever the gospel is preached, it is a joyful sound to those who hear it. It's good news. And it is a joyful sound to those who hear it. So let's go into something very personal, especially... Our concern is the next generation or the unchurched or the unbelievers, those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Could it be among the many reasons that the unbelieving world, the unchurched, have so little interest or so little use of our Christianity? You know why? Could it be that we have already lost our sense of joy in the gospel? Could it be that it doesn't really show much in our lives? It doesn't really show much in the things that we do. 
in our events, for example, in, you know, even in our small groups, in, in the things that you do in the church or in the office or in the home, and they can't see that sense of joy in us. So the question is, why would anyone want to listen to what we are saying? Really, what's the point? Who wants to join Christianity if all they see are faces? Anyway. So please don't, you know. But the thing is this, even for us pastors and for all of us leaders, small group leaders, for all of us in the church here, could there be any reason why they don't want to be a part of us? They don't want to be a part of the good news? Why? Why? Can they see that joy that Jesus has promised to us? In other words, the proof that the gospel is really, really powerful for most people will be for what they see in us. Do you believe that? You know, we're so good in debating about the gospel. We're so good in trying to go deep and deep and deep about the scriptures. We argue, we debate the second coming and all of this. We're so good in that. We can even sing beautiful songs over here and it can help us lift the spirit. But none of that is more impactful of a life that is full of joy all the time. Say with me, all the time. It's all the time because it says standing orders. All the time, be cheerful, all the time. It's all the time, pray. All the time. And then Jesus said in John 15, 11, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be where? In you. The joy of God is in us. And that's how it works, from the inside out. And we have always been talking about this, that joy does not depend on whether you have a job or not. It does not depend on the circumstances. It does not depend whether you have a paycheck or not. Joy does not depend on what your friends have treated you. No, joy does not depend on your health. It does not depend on the state of your marriage today and it does not depend whether your children are with you or not. It does not even depend on who is in Malacanang today. No. It does not depend who is winning in the basketball team. No. Because the first proof or evidence that the gospel is powerful for most people will be for what they will see in us and through us. Amen? I want you to consider this. Because you are here this morning, and in spite of the bad weather, you are here. And we praise God for that. Okay? Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. It was He who brought all of us here. I want you to consider this. We are here this morning to worship the Lord. Okay? If we come to the worship service, first and foremost with the problems, our problems in mind, okay? And we cannot help it. We have all kinds of problems. Nobody is exempted. You know, it comes from the home sometimes. Before you left, there was already some stress and tension. You know, I don't know, whatever it was. And so as you come to the church, you are focusing on your problem. I don't know how big it is. So what happened is this. You come for a worship service, but your focus is on your problems. So you carry it over. You come in. And then you look around. And then the whole service is done. Guess what? You will begin to judge the whole worship service on how you feel and have felt. 
Your reference will be on your emotions. You are not feeling well. You are focused on your problem. And so you begin to look at people. You begin to look at all the musicians over here. You begin to listen to all their songs. And it's wrong. Everything seems to be so wrong. Because your focus is in your problems. But you see, we come to a worship service and our focus should be on Him. And so my suggestion is, could you please leave your problems behind the doors as you come? And this morning, somebody told me, Basi, pick up on sang iban. Please don't. You know, you leave your problems behind. And then when you come to worship the Lord, you focus on God and not on your problems. And no matter how much you focus on your problem, that will never be solved. But who knows, as you focus on God, God will do something about your problems. And by the time you go out, your problem is no longer there. I hope not picked up by other people. Do you agree? And so that's exactly, that's why you, you cannot focus. You know, I love photography. And the rule in photography is always focus, 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 focus. And there's even a, a, a way how to focus on one object and make everything else blurred. Bokeh, they call it. So you focus and you focus. That's the secret of a worship service. And all the songs that we're singing here is just to help all of us start to just really focus, 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 focus. Don't focus on your problem. Focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. And for as long as church members or church goers focus on themselves, there will never be joy in the worship services. Amen. You got it? And I don't know, this could not be you. Sometimes I find myself, I, I'm not saying you follow me. I find myself slowly just raising my hand. I just want to do it. You know why? I just want to focus on the Lord. And as you focus on the Lord, sometimes it comes naturally. The worst thing that can happen is when I try to raise my hand and I see myself there. That's abomination. So when you raise your hand and you begin to focus on the Lord, you can't help it but to glorify God. Am I getting through? Now, let me quote again Professor Denny, and he has a good word for this point. This is what he said. Let God be great in the assembly of his people. Let him be lifted up as he is revealed to us in Jesus Christ. And then what happens, he says? And joy will fill our hearts. If the services of the church are dull, it is because he has been left outside. So instead of leaving Jesus outside, we should leave our problems outside. Amen. Some Christians, by the way, seem to think that they have a sacred duty to be gloomy. Parang it's their duty to be gloomy. Some Christians, they cannot take it when some Christians are smiling. They don't, like, they don't like you to smile. They don't like you even to l laugh. For them, laughter is abomination. Oh, come on. If you want to hear people laugh, come to Ictus. There are all kinds of laughter here. Why? Look, look at Nehemiah. Chapter 8, verse 10. This is the religion of the Bible. Everybody read Nehemiah. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Can you imagine that? Can you find yourself being sustained all day long by the joy of the Lord? Or you can only go half of the day because there is so much focus on the negative things. Look at Proverbs 17. A cheerful heart is good medicine. And we know, and we know that even the medical world has already accepted this. There is a powerful dynamic going on. 
that when you begin to think on the positive things, whatever is right, whatever is noble, whatever is great, whatever, all of this, you think on these things, why it does something to you, not only spiritually, not only emotionally, but even your physical body. And for those who don't know this, they're always stressful. They're always getting sick. You know, why? Look at the Word of God. A cheerful heart is good medicine. There's nothing wrong with that. I like what Charles Spurgeon said. It, it's very, very plain. He said, oh, dear friends, you may rejoice. Why? Because God has laid no embargo upon rejoicing. <laughs> he puts no restriction upon happiness. Do believe it that you are permitted to be happy. Amen. Do believe that there is no ordinance of God commanding you to be miserable. Ay, kaluoy man, no? Some people have that gloomy face. Parang it's a virtue to look very unhappy. Look at the person next to you and say, I thank God for your face. <laughs> Really, because you are cheerful. You know, you're cheerful. Don't focus on your problems when you're inside a worship service. Focus on God. Amen. Everybody shout amen. amen. Hey, Lord, but they can have. We're a happy, clappy kind of people over here. And that's the way to honor God. So when we present our faith as something that is dull and boring, Tell me, will the people outside ever want to join us? Why should they? They couldn't find a reason. So if ever they rejected the gospel, it's not because they rejected the gospel. They rejected the people who knows the gospel, but it does not show in their face. It doesn't show in their face. Hello? But sometimes when you find joyless Christians, you would rather be among the company of friendly unbelievers. And they're nice sometimes. They're also decent people. They just know how to laugh. They just know how to smile, you know. So we should pray for more shining and cheerful faces and a new appreciation of all that God has done for us. Okay, can we do that? Let's go to the second point. Very, very simple, okay? You pray without ceasing. What does it mean? Well, in the Phillips, it says, never stop praying. The message says, pray all the time. Now, of the three standing orders, I think this one causes the most problem because people do not understand what it means to pray without ceasing. Could it be that every thought and every spoken word would be a prayer directed to the Lord? You know, in a sense, I would say yes. And if this is how we understand and look at prayer, then your life and mine ought to be that. It's almost like a lifestyle, a prayer life offered to the Lord 24-7. And prayer should not be just one part of our life. Prayer should be every part, 24-7 of our lives. Let me quote one speaker who says, Praying without ceasing is like a net used to catch fish. When a net functions properly, it lets the water flow through while catching the fish. But if there's a hole in the net, the fish go free. The same is true when we pray. There are to be no holes in our prayer net. That means everything is included. Everything is included. And so we have to deliberately understand this. You know what it means to pray without ceasing? To pray 24-7, to be in communion with God all the time. It means that God is always in your thoughts all the time in everything that you do. It doesn't mean that we only stop everything and then pray because there's a need to pray. 
And we do that sometimes. And there's nothing wrong with that except that you go through life without any thought of God. And then because there's a need, somebody called, there's a crisis like this morning. I receive an email that the wife is going to have cancer. And so he said, well, let's pray. And that's good. And sometimes that's how we treat our prayer life. But no, 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 no. It will be a 24-7 every time. You're, it's almost like your cell phone. It's always on all the time. You're always in communion with God. So it doesn't mean that you, you pray in the morning, then you stop. You never think about God all day long. And then you think about God again in the evening. And then you start to pray again. And there are some people who want to make this prayer sensational. There's nothing wrong with that. Except that for the rest of the day, you never had a chance to think about God. And then at the end of the day, you just want to make a big thing out of it. You know, like yesterday, our guest, they wanted to eat. And I said, okay, let's go somewhere else. But it was raining hard, so we have to take a vehicle. And in the midst of the traffic, I was saying, oh, my, where can you find a parking space? So on the way out to Iktos, I said, Lord, give us a good parking space. And there's heavy traffic going on. Lo and behold, it's just a matter of seconds. Somebody backs out. We go in right in front of the restaurant. See, that's God. You know, you talk, Lord, when you're driving, Lord, I need a parking space. See, what would have happened if I said, wait, we need a parking space. Hey, guys, 200 of you, you gather, you gather. Oh, in the name of the Lord, we need a parking space. Oh, come on. You know, you know, you don't have to do that, you know. But when God is a part of you all day long, God honors that too. Amen. And then in the morning before we started, we were having a little conversation with our, the author and the founder of this. And I said, oh, the weather is bad. No problem. Lord, give us a good weather. Tapos. By the time we, we left the office, the sun was there. So we don't have to gather everyone, 200 guys. Come on, let's all kneel down and blah, 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 blah. Oh, come on. Tell the person next to you, oh, come on. That's what it means to pray without ceasing. Definitely, when that is our understanding, then we begin to offer our lives like a prayer life. We become conscious of prayer we do it persistently, not only on hard times. There will always be hard times, and we need to pray during those hard times. You see, that's how we were taught, that we only pray when there is a big need, when there is a crisis, and we leave God out of our, our lives the rest of the day. So you know what happens? We get frustration. We get irritated. There's a lack of peace. There's a lot of, so much confusion and tempers flare and all of this and discouragement. But when we have that kind of understanding, inviting God in communion every hour, every minute of the day, providing for our daily needs, then there is so much peace in us. Okay? By the way, we should not take our blessings for granted. Oh, yes, we should thank God. And God has been giving us blessings upon blessing. And of course, we should not even say that we deserve all those blessings. If God gives us those blessings, we thank God for it. Oh, by the way, one of the blessings that we had yesterday was this. Really, it even hit the, the heart of Bob Jukes and David Parfit. Because we were having this disciple-making convergence, and people came from different areas. Cebu, Tacloban, Dumaguete. And you know what happened? Uh, we have a church in Dumaguete, and Pastor Joven was trying to disciple Chris. And Chris discipled three guys, all of them 12 years old. And when these three 12-year-old heard that we are going to have a disciple 
making conference, you know what they did? Ang tanan nila nga Pasko during Christmas time, the money that the lolas and the lolos gave and all the mothers gave, they saved it, 550 to pay for the registration of this disciple-making conference. Three of them. They don't want to go for free. They want to pay the registration. And when we told the story to Bob Jukes, he said, oh, I should bring this to America. And so they were videoed, and I think they're going to show it in America. And only to show you that even little children now, today, wants to be discipled. And not only that, I won't mention the name, but somebody came and said, I want to give something to those three boys. Okay. So it was in an envelope. I gave it to the three of them during lunch. And they were so surprised. You know, they never expected that. So the amount was 2000 I think. And so they have to divide it into three. I was waiting for their response. I was waiting for them to say, now we can go to SM. But you know what they said? Now we have money for the camp next summer. The money will be for the camp next summer. Can you imagine that? And I said, wow, Lord, we thank you even for this. For us, this is a blessing. And God has something for us. That even little boys now, not, they're not little boys, 12-year-old, they are so serious about disciple-making. Isn't that something to give praise to the Lord? Ooh, let's give the Lord a big praise for raising up this next generation. Okay? Kitaya sometimes mapalibri pa, hindi pa mag-disciple. But these guys are already doing it, okay? So, oh, by the way, there's a little story here about a man by the name of Sergei Nikolai. He was the pastor of a Russian church. And he has a lifestyle of prayer. Among the many great achievements that he had, you know, he's, everybody knows that his life is all about prayer. And the kind of prayer that I said, a conversational prayer, he prays for everyone, okay? So he died, and the next pastor who replaced him during the necrological service faced the family, and he said, you are John's children, you are his grandchildren, and you are his great-grandchildren, and I tell you the truth. You are what you are, and where you are, it's because of your father's prayer. Now, sometimes we want to be known by something else. We want to be known by the achievements that we did, all the things that we do, and all of that, you know, all of this. When people come to our funeral and say, I know this man because of his prayer life. He prays continually. Amen? Let's go to number three. Be thankful in every circumstance. Be thankful whatever the circumstances may be, Phillips. Be thankful in all circumstances, the living. Whatever happens, keep thanking God because of Jesus Christ. I know that in hard times, that is the best time to thank God. Because we know he loves us and we know he does not change. His love will always be there. And so this, this in every circumstance, everything just simply revolves there. We should give thanks in the good times and we should give thanks in the bad times. And so we say, praise God from whom all blessings flow. I want you to think about this. If we are so used in giving thanks to God only when we have enough money in the bank, if we only give thanks to God because we don't have cancer, if we only give thanks to God because our children have all the good jobs and good businesses, if we only give thanks because everything is growing well with your family and all of that, my question is, if we are so used to giving thanks in the good times, but not on the bad times, what do you think will happen when trouble comes? What do you think will happen? 
Will you still give thanks to the Lord? And that's a hard question. I know it's hard. I know it's not easy, but I think the point is it's not easy, but it is absolutely necessary. Yes. Most of you have been traveling. This morning, our brother Chad Saika was here, and he's a pilot. And sometimes when you ride a plane, all of a sudden there's a bad weather. So what does the pilot do? He goes above the clouds. And sometimes it's funny, when you go above the cloud, everything becomes so bright because the sun is out there. You, in fact, have to close the windows of the plane to see low. And then it is time to land. All of a sudden, it's dark and raining. That's what life is all about. When you look at the dark clouds, sometimes we forget that behind those clouds is the shining face of God. No matter what happens in the dark moments, God is always on the other side. Amen? It's always there. And sometimes we complain, Lord, in the midst of my problem, I cannot trace your hand. Of course, it's hard to trace the canvas of God. The canvas of the Lord in his painting is the whole galaxy. How can you trace his hand? You just have to trust him no matter what. And that is why we have to give thanks in all circumstances, even when we don't feel like doing it. You know why? Even when you don't feel like giving thanks and you still give thanks to the Lord, you are actually proclaiming, you are actually declaring to the whole world that the wisdom of God is greater than mine. He knows what's best for me. Therefore, it is biblical to give thanks in all circumstances, even in the worst moments of your life. We give thanks because our God is sovereign. We give thanks because nothing happens by chance. We give thanks because God causes all things to work together for good for his children. We give thanks because hard times reveal my character. We give thanks because hard times reveal my weaknesses. We give thanks because in hard times it breaks my pride and shows my need for total dependence on the Lord. We give thanks because God has triumphed over sin and death through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We give thanks because God uses the worst moments of our lives to promote our spiritual growth. We give thanks because God is faithful even when we are faithless. We give thanks because the word of God will be vindicated in the end. We give thanks because God's promises are true. We give thanks because evil will not reign forever. We give thanks because heaven is real. We give thanks because this world is not the real world. We give thanks when we are weak because God is strong. We give thanks because his grace is sufficient for every situation. We give thanks that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We give thanks because our salvation Rest on God and not on us. We give thanks because there is no pit so deep and dark that the love of God is not deeper. We give thanks because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from every sin. We give thanks because God delights to save sinners like you and me. We give thanks that the Lord can soften the hardest heart. We give thanks in every situation. Because there are no impossible cases with God. We give thanks that even when you feel lonely, you are never alone because God is with you. We give thanks because our Father will not test us beyond what we can bear. We give thanks that the Holy Spirit abides with us always. We give thanks that the Lord Jesus feels your pain right now. We give thanks that the Holy Spirit prays for us when we are too weak to pray for ourselves. We give thanks to the Lord Jesus intercede for us right now. We give thanks that Jesus uses everything and wastes nothing. We give thanks that my doubts and your doubts cannot cancel the work of God in us. 
We give thanks that someday you and I will be conformed to the image of God. We give thanks that God is faithful to finish His work in us. We give thanks that our hardships equip us to minister to others. We give thanks that we are invited to come boldly to the throne of grace. We give thanks that God's plan far exceeds our puny imagination. We give thanks that weeping endures for the night, but what? Joy comes in the morning. We give thanks that we are still God's children even when we are, our faith falters. We give thanks while we suffer outwardly today, we are being renewed inwardly. We give thanks that our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory. Hallelujah, God. In everything, give thanks. Let's listen to Eugene Peterson. He, he somehow nicely catches this. Everybody, please read. Do you belong to Christ? He says, no matter what happens. No matter what happens. Wow. We are living in this fallen world. We are living in this sinful world. Problems and troubles and trials and you name it will always be there. We are living in this fallen world. Bad things always happen to good people. Even the highest people know their share of sorrow. And some people seem to receive more than their share of pain. Yes, there is no escaping in this planet Earth. No one gets a free ride through life. And yesterday, one of the things they pointed out, if you want to be a disciple maker, behind every smiling face is a story. Can you imagine if all of us are concerned about that? You see, we're so concerned about ourselves. But behind every smiling face here, there is a story behind that. He or she may be in pain. He or she needs something else. He or she just needs a comfort. But we just breeze through life. We end the service without the consciousness. As you look in that smiling face, something is happening in their lives too. That is what church is all about. It's not just to come and say hallelujah and then go home. No. We need each other. We need to look beyond those smiling faces and then say, thank you, Lord, no matter what happens. Amen? Again, as I say this, I'm not saying this is easy, okay? No, it's not. I'm only saying this because it is absolutely necessary. It is necessary. If you refuse to give thanks in every situation, you know what you're saying? You know better than God how to run the universe. That's what you're saying. And so by giving thanks when we don't feel like it, we are again proclaiming the wisdom of God is greater than ours. The simple act of giving thanks in the midst of sorrow, I believe, is more powerful than the testimony of 10,000 words spoken when things are going well. You know, we always hear testimonies, oh, God bless me, God bless me. Okay, that's nice to hear, and we praise the Lord for that. On the other hand, when things are not going well, but you keep on hearing people continually giving thanks to the Lord. They are proclaiming in faith, Lord, no matter what happens, we trust in you. Your wisdom is greater than mine. We give you thanks. So what is the will of God for your life? Rejoice. Pray without. In everything give. For this is the will of God. These three things, by the way, will be seen very clearly in the darkness than in the light. 
it is in the worst moments of our life that this will be seen clearly. It's not only for us, but you know it's also for the unbelieving world. It's for us because when these things really happen to us, then we know, when we know that God is in us, because we have now the power and the desire to do these things, praise God. But it's not only for us. When the unbelieving world will see us in the midst of pain, in the, need, in the midst of our worst situation, and we keep on continually praising God and thanking God, then they will know that the real thing is in you. Then they will know that you know that Jesus is in you. And you know what? They want to know what you know. They want to know about Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, will they know you? Through us. Forgive us, Lord, for complaining when we should be rejoicing. Teach us to pray not only on good times, but continually. Not only on crisis times. Lord, you have given us so much blessings. One more thing we need, Lord. Give us a grateful heart. Lord, we pray for each and everyone here that you give us lives that will always rejoice. You give us heart that will continue to pray, always giving thanks in every situation. In fact, Lord, give us lives in this church as ictus that we can all shout with one loud voice, thank you, Lord for all that you have done. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you all.